in a multiple linear regression, we have two or more independent variables, and we want to determine their contribution to a single dependent variable. In a simple linear regression, we have one independent variable and one dependent variable. When working with linear regressions, it's important to recognize that independent variables are sometimes referred to as predictor variables or explanatory variables, and dependent variables are sometimes referred to as outcome variables or response variables. So taking a look at these fictitious data I have loaded in the data view in SPSS, I have three predictor variables and their scores on three instruments, a depression inventory, an anxiety inventory, and a substance use inventory. And our dependent variable, our outcome variable, is functioning. And in this case, let's presume that all these variables are recorded as t-scores. T-scores have a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. There are several assumptions for a multiple linear regression, including the sample size. And one common rule is that you need 20 records for each predictor variable. So in this case, I have three predictor variables. So I would need at least 60 records. That rule only applies if the dependent variable is normally distributed. If the dependent variable is not normally distributed, you'd want more than 20 for each independent variable. So in this data set, I have 100 records. So I meet that assumption, and I am going to check for normality in the outcome variable functioning. Other assumptions include an absence of outliers in all the variables, a linear relationship between the independent variables and the dependent variable, and an absence of multicollinearity between the independent variables. All these assumptions can be checked as part of the linear regression procedure except for the dependent variable being normally distributed. So I'm going to check that assumption first. So I'm going to go to Analyze, Descriptive Statistics, Explore, and this is what the dialog looks like by default. So I'm going to move Functioning over to the Dependent list, then move over to Plots, I'm going to uncheck Stem and Leaf, check off Histogram, and then check off Normality Plots with Tests. Click Continue, and then OK. So I'm just checking to see if the functioning variable is normally distributed. And normally here, I'm going to interpret the Shapiro-Wilk, and we're looking for a non-statistically significant result so that we can assume we have a normally distributed variable, and we have that. 0.516 is greater than 0 0.005. So we would assume in this case that this variable is normally distributed. If you were to interpret the Kolmogorov Smirnov test, we have a significance here, a p value here of 0.2. So again, not statistically significant. So with either test of normality, we would assume the data are normally distributed in that variable. Moving back to the data view, we can now start configuring the multiple linear regression. So we'll go to Analyze regression, and linear. And this is what the dialog looks like by default. I'm going to move functioning, that's our outcome variable, over to dependent. And for independent, I'm going to hold down control and select depression, anxiety, and substance use, and move them over to the independent list box. Under statistics, I'm going to add R squared change descriptives and part and partial correlations, as well as case-wise diagnostics. Estimates is checked off by default, and we'll leave it that way. Press continue. Then for plots, I want to check off the normal probability plot. And for the y-axis, I want z, res, 
ID. So Z R I S ID goes to Y. And then into the X axis, I want Z P R E D. Those are loaded in, so I'll click Continue. Under Save, I'm going to leave everything as default, except I'm going to click on uh, Cook's Distance. That's the one metric I'll add, one statistic I'll add here. Now I'll click Continue. Under Options, I'm going to make no changes. I'm going to uh, exclude cases list-wise here. There are no missing values in this data set. So the missing values, the different selections here wouldn't make a difference. I'll click Continue. And then I'll make no changes to the style. So this is now configured to run the multiple linear regression. I'll click OK. You can see that the regression output starts with the descriptive statistics. So we have the mean and the standard deviation for all the variables, starting uh, here with functioning. And remember, these are t-scores, so we would expect a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. And all of these variables are fairly close to that. The next table is correlations. And again, here we can check for assumptions. The first one we want to check for is to make sure that we do not have multicollinearity between the predictor variables. If a correlation was greater than 0.7, then for the purposes of regression, we would say that those variables are multicollinear. So that would not be ideal. So we're looking for values here that would be less than 0.7, uh, but only between the predictors. So first we look at uh, depression and depression's correlation with anxiety. That's within bounds, 0 0.431. And substance use, 0 0.276. And then anxiety and substance use here, 0.501, all those values less than 0.7. So we'd say that none of these predictors are multicollinear. Additionally, we want the predictor variables to correlate with the outcome variable at a value greater than 0.3. So if we look here at the functioning outcome variable, a depression is 0.392, anxiety 0.534 and substance use 0.388, all above 0.3. So we've met those assumptions. Next, I'm going to move down to the plots at the end of the output because one of the assumptions that we, is that we have a linear relationship between the independent variables and the dependent variable. So what we're looking here uh, from this probability probability plot is that these points are more or less following this line. And we can see, although there are some deviations here, they generally do appear to fall this line. If we look at the scatter plot, you can see we have the regression standardized residual on the y-axis. That's where we placed it. And the regression standardized predicted value on the x-axis. And what we're looking for here is that none of these points fall outside of negative 3 to 3, either on the x-axis or the y-axis. So in this case, uh, we're in good shape because none of the uh, values are greater than 3 and none of the values are less than negative 3. Next, I'm going to move up to residuals statistics. And I'm going to look for the standard residual. You can see that's right here. Standard residual, the minimum negative 2.412, and the maximum 2.007. That's a good range for the standard residual. We don't want to be outside of negative 3 to 3. And then I'm going to look at the Cook's distance. You see a minimum of 0, a maximum of 0.144. Uh, for Cook's distance, we don't want a value greater than 1. So we're OK here as well. If the Cook's distance here was greater than 1, and you wanted to identify that record in the data set, Cook's distance is saved as a new variable in the data view. So if I were to move back over 
to the data view, you can see Cook's distance here is the last variable in the data set. It was created as part of the linear regression procedure because I checked off the Cook's distance box. So if you wanted to see the maximum value uh, sort descending, and it brings the maximum value to the top. Of course, this is well under the limit of 1. But if we had a value greater than 1, you could easily see what record uh, it was associated with. So I'll just resort this by ID and go back to the output. And I'm going to move up to the model summary. And you can see you have uh, the R value and R square and then the adjusted R square. So we would interpret the adjusted R square if we had a small sample size. In this case, since the minimum sample size was 60, and we have 100, and our dependent variable is normally distributed, I feel comfortable interpreting the R square. You can see they're not much different. Uh, so what this R square says is that our model explains 33.4% of the variance in the dependent variable which is statistically significant. You see it over here to the right. That's a statistically significant finding. You can see below the model summary you have an ANOVA table. And this ANOVA tests the null hypothesis that the slope of the line is zero. So we would want a significant finding here. And we do have statistical significance here. Then looking at the coefficients table, you can see we have depression, anxiety, and substance use. Then we have unstandardized coefficients, so 0 0.218, 0 0.43, and 0.16. These will be the values used in the regression equation. But we're going to interpret the standardized coefficients here, beta. And this standardizes the contributions of all three variables. And you can see that the contribution of anxiety seems to be uh, much greater than of depression and substance use. But this standardized coefficient, beta, allows you to compare the three variables. You can't compare them using the unstandardized coefficients, but you can using the standardized coefficients. And for significance, we have the p-values. Uh, we'll look, again, we're looking for less than the alpha of 0 0.05. So we have statistical significance for depression, for anxiety, but not for substance use. 0.136 is not statistically significant. And then under correlations here, I'm going to interpret the part, sometimes called the semi-partial correlation. And this explains the unique contribution of each predictor variable and it's important to note that this value is not squared. So you can see the greatest unique contribution is for the predictor anxiety. So if we're analyzing real data, and these were actual results, we would uh, interpret either, again, R-square or adjusted R-square. I think in this case R-square is fine, but either way, a value of greater than 0.3 is considered a good fit. Under ANOVA, we can reject the null hypothesis that the slope of the line is zero. And then looking at the coefficients, uh, we would say that depression and anxiety made a significant contribution to change in the dependent variable, but the substance use inventory score uh, did not. So if you were choosing scores that predict movement in the functioning variable, in this case you'd pick the depression inventory and the anxiety inventory and probably would not pick the substance use inventory.